I did a show recently entitled You Can't Say That. Okay. It had a list of words that were offensive to people's sensibilities that we determined by doing a fair amount of research. And on the list was mom and dad. Mm. You can't say mom and dad anymore. And I was like, okay, I'm here to learn. So tell Mm -hmm. me why you can't say mom and dad anymore. And a woman in the audience said, well, at my home, we don't have a mom and a dad. Mm -hmm. We have a mom and a mom. Right. And it hurts our daughter's feelings to bring home a letter that says, dear mom and dad. To which my first response was, you've never taken home a letter that said, dear mom and dad. Show me a letter, go home, find it, send me a letter that said, (laughs) dear mom and dad. It always says parents. Uh. Dear parents. It doesn't say dear mom and dad. Are you making a problem where one doesn't exist? Uh. And I've called my mom and dad, who are both passed away, mom and dad, for 70 years. Mm-hmm. Am I supposed to change how I refer to my parents because your nuclear family is a mom and a mom? Mm. I asked that as not a rhetorical question. It really was, are you saying, are you expecting that for you to be comfortable that I change the way I refer to my deceased parents? How did they answer? Well, very nice lady, by the way. Yeah. And she said, no, not really, not personally, but I don't want my daughter to feel like she is in some way different or inferior. She said, I think that's why that's on the list. Yeah. I said, well, you know, that may be why it's on the list, but I guess that's what I'm saying when some people say, is that my fight to mm. take up and do I need to change my life pattern because you have a daughter that's living in a mom and mom home? I think that's where people say, have we gone too far where we're spending our time working on this kind of thing when we have other battles to fight? Yeah, yeah. And that's what I mean when I say some people say, should this be on my to-do list? I, it, it seems improbable to me uh, that people are asking other people to change what they call their own parents. It seems highly probable to me that in forms at the doctor's office and communications from schools, as you were referring to, in places like that, it, it just makes logical sense in a multi-generational world, in a world with different kinds of family structures, to just say something like adult uh, one, adult two, or something like that. Like when I fill out, I, I will, I will, I will out myself here and say that when I fill out a doctor's form and it says mother's name, father's name, and I'm straight, I cross out mother and father and I write parent one and parent two, or adult one and adult two, for exactly the reason that I it, it doesn't. To me, that's an easy fix. It doesn't hurt anyone. It includes more people rather than fewer people and it's more accurate it's in, it's 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 in a world where we know there's so many different family structures there's step families and there's there's um gay families and there's grandparents raising kids why not create an environment and when it's when it's so easy to just let people fill in whoever is the appropriate parent and guardian in their home um that that for me is different than saying, Dr. Phil, this is how you should refer to your your deceased parents. And I am sorry uh, that they, they're no longer in your, your life. Um, those seem like very different issues to me. Yeah. And as I say, this was a delightful woman. And she said, I'm just talking about anything that someone might say that would cause my daughter to feel differently. And no, I don't expect you to change it after oh, 70 good. years. Oh, so good. she was an was... absolutely delightful woman and not trying to stir up trouble or whatever. But she said, this is why that's on the list. And yeah. I learned something from what she said. But I won't change how I refer to my mother and father. 
then she was saying, no, we're not, I want you to. Yeah, no, agreed. And and I, that is a, that's a good example of one where, gosh, if it's, you know, if, if it's, if it's not presented correctly, it sounds absurd. It just sounds ridiculous. Um, as opposed to if it's a very specific, like, can we just, you know, on paperwork when we're speaking to big groups of people, include all of them. Yeah. And that was one of those situations where I thought she contributed to the conversation by making people think about, oh, well, okay, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Master bedroom was on the list. Yeah. And I knew that one, but I had someone comment on it and explained what used to happen in the master's bedroom. And a lot of people, light bulbs came on over their head. And so it was a great discussion. Yeah, that's a new one. That's one that in the course of writing A More Just Future, that's where that one came to my awareness. And and I understand in the real estate industry, there's been some shifting of vocabulary. I have to confess, I still can't, the word master bedroom comes out of my mouth. Like, you know, if I'm saying, oh, we need to repair the air conditioner in the master bedroom, and I'm like, oh, so it's a process. Yeah. Habits are hard to change. That's why I say you can remind yourself or someone could gently remind you instead of attack you yeah. <laughs> about it, which sometimes happens. Yes. But I love your concept of a goodish person versus a good person, because that means we're all works in progress, right? Exactly. It means we're all growing and changing and we don't have to meet some absolute standard. That's right. Exactly. And I'll say one more thing about, since you said standard, I consider goodish to be a higher standard than good. Oh, um, for sure. Right? Because good is yeah. just like, you just like, you just get to declare it and and don't have to work for it. Whereas goodish, I'm like, you know, it's like flossing. I got to do it every day. Um, it's an yeah. ongoing thing. But in most parts of our life, we're proud that we're, you know, we're better at our jobs now than we were a year ago, or, you know, we're better at using that technology now than we were a year ago when it comes to this part of our lives called being a good person we somehow think that we're just supposed to like have it in a static way as opposed to being able to say i'm i'm a better person now than i was a year ago and i think this idea of being goodish speaks to that that higher standard of let's just keep getting better there's one thing that i wanted you to talk about a little bit if you will and i don't want to keep you forever and i'm nope. <laughs> had such a great discussion. But in your book, in chapter five, you talk about rejecting some racial fables. Mm. If you would talk about that a little bit for the listeners. Sure. Well, I, in that chapter, I, I I tell the story of a 42-year-old woman named Louise McCauley, who, since she was a child, had been um, she was a, a Black girl in uh, the 1960s. And or growing up in the 40s and 50s. And she, uh, her grandparents were worried that she was um, so willing to speak up if a white child sort of expected her to move off the sidewalk as was the norm uh, in her community, that she would sort of, she would, she would fight that kid rather than move off the sidewalk. And that as an adult, she had her full-time job, but then she would spend each evening and each weekend volunteering for the NAACP. Um, and this woman who was so had so much courage and conviction in, in um, commitment to racial justice was one day coming home from work and she was asked to yield her seat to a white, a white passenger and she refused to do it. And the police ended up being called. And she said, when the police arrived, why do you push us around? Um, And she would be arrested. And uh, Dr. Martin Luther King would get wind of this, uh, this stance that she had taken in Montgomery, Alabama, because uh, Louise McCauley's full name was Rosa Louise McCauley Parks. And I share her full name now because the story I just told you is so different than the story I learned and that most of us have learned about Rosa Parks, um, in which she was a tired seamstress that was an accidental activist, was elderly, she was 42, (laughs) and, (laughs) and, uh, and, and that, you know, she pointed out this this injustice 
and um, and and Dr. King came in and sort of amplified this injustice. And then the population said, oh, my gosh, that's right. We should fix that. And and thus change happened. Um, that second version of the story I told is is a fable. It's not true. There's ample evidence. It's not controversial. The gene the uh, Jean Thea Harris has written the um, the sort of definitive uh, scholarly biography and Soldat O'Brien has a documentary now out based on it that shows the first version of the history that I just described as what really happened. But this fable where there's sort of accidental activism and widespread support is problematic because it leads us, it leads me and it leads us as a society to expect that that's how change happens that it happens in a way that's that's easily digested, that's linear, um, that's not polarizing. And the reality is that's not how change happened then. By the way, many other people had attempted what she attempted before and not been successful. It had not led to widespread support and marches and movements. Um, which is another thing about the messiness of how change happens is there's lots of failed attempts and then there's some unexpected tipping point that we can't quite describe where why in that moment it galvanized people. And so I I realized that I I'm not even really a history buff. So this idea of thinking about the past is coming from my interest as a psychologist and understanding how people think and act. Um, and so I realized that my understanding of the past is just, boy, one fable after another. And I think I'm sort of average in my knowledge of American history. I'm deep in my love of my country, but maybe average in my deep uh, historical knowledge. And this fable that a lot of us like me have internalized sets us up to look at efforts to make change now and feel like they're not working because it's not fitting that linear fable-like um, narrative. That is so well said, because if people think it's supposed to happen in this way and it's not, then it's like, I'm doing something wrong. Right. <laughs> if they understand that's not the way it happened to begin with, that's not the way it does happen, then they maybe don't judge themselves so much and continue to work not in a linear fashion, but just continue to work and things right. happen sometimes simultaneously, right. sometimes in three different locations at the same mm -hmm. time. Yeah.